Good Sunday morning, church. It's great to see you today. We've got a great, a great opportunity today. We get to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Come on, let's stand up together as we lift our voices. Let's sing with all that we have today. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have life for my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. heart. Floods of joy or my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like a sea billow This morning, would you please be seated? Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful post-Easter and a really beautiful weekend that's been going on. Just want to come up here and give a few announcements for us while we continue in worship. First up, if you could check in for us, please. That is always greatly appreciated. Info's on the screen right behind me. You could just text, check to the church's number, or fill out that blue card and put it in one of the boxes by the side doors or in the foyer. Always appreciated knowing that you're here. That's how we like to stay connected. I got two announcements for us. First is that Pizza with the Pastors is next Sunday at noon. This is our, our new member class. You just need to text pizza to the church's number. If you want to become a member at Stetson Baptist, if you want to see uh, what does this church believe in, uh, if you want to meet the pastors, if you want to enjoy some really good pizza, just sign up for this. It's like an hour and a half long, and it's actually really enjoyable, so please be a part of that. And our next announcement is that we have a camp fundraiser lunch today. It's pulled pork. I am very excited for this one. I, I think with my stomach a lot of times. It's after the 9.45 and the 11 o'clock services. Please come, uh, get a meal, uh, give to the, the student camp. Camp was a, a huge part of my life growing up, and I know that a lot of these students would really appreciate uh, getting some help as they, they make their way and they experience something fantastic at God's life this summer. All right, that's our announcements. Let me pray for us as we continue in worship. God, I, I am so thankful that you sent Jesus and he came into my heart. Wow, God, the, the grace and the love that you offer. God, I, I pray that we, we return praise to you as, as what little thanks that we could give so we could give you all the glory that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we continue to worship, would you stand with us as we sing about what Jesus has done for us on the cross? Let's sing. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone and 
Jesus 
let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you that we can proclaim today what you've done at Calvary and that covers our sin, our guilt, our shame. And Lord, we proclaim our love for you today for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please be seated? morning. So good to see you this morning. What a wonderful uh, what a wonderful day we've already had. A couple of quick things before we kind of get started and launch uh, into this new series called Signs of the Times. I want to just talk with you real quickly about last week. Easter was a pretty fabulous day. It really was. Um, had a wonderful time and I, I'm so glad that we had the privilege of being able to be together and just uh, see the Lord work in our midst. Um, Y'all, we had 1,371 people attend church last Sunday. Yeah. And that is, uh, that is an exciting thing to see. I, I talked to my dad yesterday, and he said, uh, he said, are you still basking in the glow of Easter? I said, no, you've got to get rid of that glow really fast, because if not, you'll be really disappointed when you come back and there are 1,371 people the week after Easter. I remember the first year that I served as a pastor, I was like, if I preach a good enough sermon... I know that all those people that come for Easter will come back the next week. You know what? They didn't. You just kind of have to recognize that you want to make an impact, you want to make a difference, and, and even, and I will say, you, some of, there might be somebody here today that your first Sunday was last Sunday. Thank you for coming back. Thank you so much for being here. And we're just going to ask the Lord to speak to us every time we gather, whether we have over 1,000 in attendance, whether we have 500 in attendance, whether we have 200 in attendance. You know what? If we have two in attendance, we're going to ask God to speak to us in a powerful way. Amen? I do want to say, though, that um, this year's Easter attendance is kind of a trend that's going on in our church. Uh, if you compare last year to this year, we grew by 26% this year. Every single month, we look at our attendance numbers, and we're growing year to year. We're growing by 20% almost every single month. Y'all, you look around, and I know that you do as well as I do. You look around in this room, and uh, some, you look around, and you say, well, there's some faces that I don't know. And I'll tell you, that is a good problem to have. It is good to see the body of Christ growing it is good to see the opportunity that we have to make a difference in people's lives. Uh, if you just look around our city, and I know that you don't like the traffic, I understand it. But I will tell you, in a growing area where people are moving in, there is a huge opportunity for the church. So we don't want to miss out on that opportunity. We don't want to miss out on making a difference and making an impact on the lives in the hearts and the eternity of people that God is just placing right in front of us. And so I just want to encourage you, encourage you, encourage you to recognize that God is blessing us in, a, in an immense way, and we just want to be a part of that. And we're just, we're just going to keep w walking forward hand in hand with Jesus and knowing that he's going to lead us each step of the way. We're not, we're not looking to make any you know, grand gestures or anything. We're just going to one day at a time, one week at a time, one message at a time, one small group at a time, one service opportunity at a time. We're just going to keep moving moving forward and see what God does. Yes? All right, so a couple of things I do need you to do, though. And I just need you to hear these, and you can kind of take advantage of them in the way that it sees fit for you. Number one, if you have not 
taken the step of being a part of the church, I want to encourage you to be a part of that Pizza with the Pastors meeting that's going to happen next Sunday. It'll be right after our, uh, right after our 11 o'clock service. We'll serve you lunch, and uh, it's completely free, but it really is the first step to you being a member of the church and really getting to know what the church is all about. We'd love to have you come. Second thing is if you're not already involved in a small group, I hope that you will take advantage of getting, uh, going to a small group, maybe even today, and being a part of a group of people. Because you see, as the church grows, it's going to be easier and easier to, uh, to kind of not know anybody. And it's going to be harder and harder to know somebody. But if you're in a small group, if you're in a group of people that are meeting together, all of a sudden you know and are known. And that's really, really important. And then the third thing. Friends, you've heard this from me before, but if the church is going to continue to grow, there are two areas that we have to resource. We have to, and that is our kids' ministry and our preschool ministry. If we do not have people ready to help out in our kids' ministry and preschool ministry, that will halt and stunt the growth of the church. And so if you're not engaged in that, here you are in the 830 service, y'all, we need people at 945. And I'm not saying that you have to be there every single week, but if you could be there once a month, that would really help us out a lot. And so if you're willing to be a part of that, um, you can come see us, you can give us a call here at the church, um, but we would love to engage you in our kids' ministry and our student ministry. There are, I mean, kids' ministry and preschool ministry. There are other areas that you can get involved in, but kids' ministry and preschool ministry huge opportunities, and we have to resource those areas if the church will continue to grow. All right, I'm off my soapbox. That's kind of interesting for a pastor to say that, by the way. Um, This series called The Signs of the Times, we're going to, you can just open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 today, because that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Matthew 24, and then when we get finished with Matthew 24, guess what? We're going to move over to Matthew 25. Um, This is considered uh, one of the only times that Jesus himself talked about what is to come. Uh, This Matthew 24 and 25 is typically called the Olivet Discourse. If you want to sound really smart to your friends and family, say, well, at church, we're currently studying the Olivet Discourse. And they'll say, what is that? And you say, Matthew 24 and 25. Anyway, it is, uh, it is one of the only times that Jesus addresses what is to come. I do want to talk to you a little bit about the nature of prophetic teaching and prophetic uh, scripture. Um, how many of you have ever been to the mountains? Anybody ever been to the mountains? Anybody ever seen the mountains? Yeah. You know, one of the things that happens when you go to the mountains is you can kind of stand in a certain place, one of those overlooks and one of those outlooks, and, and, and when you see a mountain range in front of you, what you see are all these shapes uh, on the horizon. But what you notice if you kind of look at a map or if you begin to progress through those mountains is what you find is that some of those shapes were really, really close to you when you were at that overlook, and some of those shapes were really tall and really far from you. You could see them all as one mountain range, but when you get through and you start to kind of really investigate them, you find that they are not just kind of a a 2D opportunity. Instead, it's very three-dimensional. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of depth to it. That is the way prophecy is in Scripture. We can see it like this, but God is saying, oh, no, 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 no. It's very three-dimensional. There's a lot more to understand. There's a lot more uh, to see. And so we're going to talk about this Matthew 24 and 25 section of Scripture. And let me just share with you how we're going to look at that because I want to be sure that we set this from the beginning and that we all understand it. So uh, we are going to, as we walk through this Scripture, we're going to, number one, try to understand the historical context. Understand the historical. So the the idea is that we're going to say, okay, is there something in history that this applies to? And I'll give you one of those here today as we read through. But we want to understand the historical. And number two, we want to consider the prophetic, meaning that we want to say, okay, well, we know something about what has happened. Now, what does this tell us about what will happen? Understand the historical Consider the, pro- the, the prophetic, but number three, and this is the primary, we want to focus on the practical. 
Now, this is really important that you hear because sometimes when we look at prophetic teaching in Scripture, everybody comes with the idea of, tell me what's going to happen. Tell me, what's, tell me what's going to occur. Give me a timeline. That is not where we're going to major. We're going to prophetic, but we're going to major on the practical. We're going to focus on what does this scripture mean for me today? How should I apply this scripture today? How should this scripture make a difference in my life today? The reason I make such a big deal out of that is because sometimes when people come to a prophetic teaching of scripture, they completely throw out the idea that it's applicable to them in their lives today. And they think, well, this is for some other time. That's not how we're going to look at this. We will look at the historical and prophetic, but we're going to major on the present day application of God's word. Always do. So we're not going to dismiss that. We're going to con continue to look at what does the word of God say to me today. So with that said, let's look at this first section of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. I'm going to read the whole scripture today, then we'll go back and talk about a few points. Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these? Do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. To give a little bit of a summary of what we've just read, Jesus is leaving the temple for, for the last time. Excuse me, got choked up about that. Jesus is leaving the temple for the last time uh, before his crucifixion. Jesus has been at the temple. If you were to flip back in your Bible, you would find that Jesus has been at the temple since chapter 21 of Matthew. He's been talking with people at the temple, and now he is leaving the temple. Uh, one, if you were to read uh, chapter 23, Jesus has really pronounced a great deal of judgment and curses against the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, and especially the religious leaders of Israel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is pronouncing all this judgment, and so the disciples come up and they say, Look at these buildings! Look how powerful we are. Look what a religious nation we are. Look at these immense monuments to our worship of God. Jesus says, make no mistake. There will come a time that not one of these stones will stand on top of another. In other words, this whole temple complex will be destroyed. Now, this is one of those moments where we have to think about the historical because this actually happened. In A.D. 70, 
the Romans besieged Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. This actually happened. So this is a historical fact. Now it had not happened when Jesus said this, but just about 30 to 40 years later, what he said here happened. And so this is, a, this is one of those moments where we can say, historically, we can see it. It was a prophecy that Jesus said, this will happen, and it did. He goes on, though, and they kind of come to him and they say, okay, great. Um, okay, so you're gonna, the, the temple's going to be destroyed. Tell us more. Tell us when will this happen. Tell us how this will happen. Tell us what's gonna, what, what should we be looking for to make sure that we're ready for this to happen. So he gives them these sayings. He says, in the last days, there will be false Christs and false prophets. There will be earthly devastations, wars and earthquakes and famines. Anybody been reading the headlines this week? What a timely time to be looking at it. He talks about that there will be tribulation or trial, meaning that Christians will be persecuted and their beliefs will be set aside and, and, and not, uh, not adhered to. There's a lot that Jesus says will happen. Now, it's interesting. The disciples come and they say, when will these things be? And he does not answer that question, does he? He says, they say, uh, what will be the sign of your coming? He does give some ideas of that. And of the end of the age, and he does give some, in, some answers to that. But he doesn't, they want to know when, and he starts telling them how. He, they want to know when, and he starts telling them what. Why is that? Well, I, I would say that it probably falls into the, reason that I think we need to take this and really apply it to our lives. How, how can we take this message and, and put it, I mean, some of you are sitting there going, I, I wasn't there that day. What does this mean to me? Now remember that many of the things that Jesus talks about here, many of the things have been accomplished, but many of them have not. And we know that the ultimate of them have not. Jesus has not returned. He will, but he has not returned. So we need to look at this and say, what, what does this mean in my life? I, I'm just going to give you a few thoughts. Number one, be ready. Number one, be ready. Can you imagine? I mean, I, this, is, this pales in comparison. But can you imagine being at home one day and hearing that this building has been destroyed. Can you imagine hearing that news? The heartache, the, 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 the upset stomach, the homesickness, the grief, the despair that our, worship, that our place of worship has been ransacked and destroyed. What, a, what an awful feeling that would be. Now take that and multiply it to an entire nation's place of worship. In the world that we live in today and in the United States of America, it would be like Washington, D.C. being wiped off the face of the map. Friends, we need to always be ready for what is to come. We need to live our lives every day with an ultimate sense that everything that we see in front of us, everything that we hold dear, everything that we have put so much value in, it is all temporary. It's all temporary. We must put more value there than we put here. And we must be ready for the day when Jesus returns and this earth is laid bare, and we need to make sure that on that day we're able to look him in the face and say, amen, come Lord Jesus, rather than wait just a second, I'm not ready. 
We need to always, always, always be ready. People ask me all the time, when do you think Jesus is going to return? I don't know. I just know it's closer now than it was yesterday. So we need to always be ready. Number two, we need to be aware. We need to be aware. He talks about these wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes. And, and, and basically what he is saying is, before the end comes, it's going to get bad. Now, I will say it's interesting to me that sometimes I have conversations about the world that we live in today, and people will come up and they'll say, oh, pastor, things are really starting to get bad. Don't you think Jesus is, is close to returning? And I always, I, sometimes in those moments, I want to say, you know, how American are we? We have a tendency to think about things being bad because things have kind of taken a little bit of a downturn right around us. Y'all, people, people are living in other places in the world, and it's been bad there for a long time. You do realize that God's not looking at America and expecting it to be bad here. God is looking at the entire world, the entire globe, all of creation. And we need to recognize that there are places where it's been as bad and worse than we have it here for a long time. So we need to make sure that in our perspective of biblical uh, prophecy that we don't get too American. That we recognize that there's a global economy here. That there's a global mindset. That there's a global population. And God made every single one of them. And he cares for every single one of them. And we have the privilege of being able to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ and recognize that, yes, things are going to be bad. So we all need to be aware. Be aware. Be cognizant of the things that are going on in the world. Now, this third point uh, is going to sound very similar, but it is different. And I, and I realize that it's going to feel a little odd when I, when I put it up there. But we need to be ready. We need to be aware. And then we need to beware. Beware. You say, well, isn't that the same as being aware? No. Being aware is, uh, is just kind of recognizing that there is truth. Uh, beware is where you are like stepping back. You're fearful. Um, you, uh, I can give you a really good example. I am very aware that snakes exist. But if one is in the room, I am very aware. Uh-uh, I don't want to have anything to do with that, right? You understand that. I can be aware of the, is, is a knowledge, is a, is a cognitive understanding. Being, beware is, whoop. I need to get inside. I need to not be a part of this moment, right? We need to beware. We need to beware that, that there are people that will come try to lead us astray. We need to beware of false prophets and false Christs. We need to beware of people that would not teach the word of God, that would tickle our ears. And, and yes, it sounds good, but it is not according to the word of God. Of God. We need to be solid on what we know we believe because there will come a day that what we believe will be challenged. And today is, or some of those days. And we need to not just rest back and not just relax about things. No. I'll give you a, I'll give you a statement in this idea of beware. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Okay, nice sermon, nice saying, nice movie, nice music, nice, uh, nice uh, political statement. What does the Bible say? How does the word of God speak to that? This is my truth. This is the word of God. This is the life that we need to live. This is the thing. I, 
I just said something and it just kind of came. You know, that has become this, there's a, there's a phrase that has become very in vogue these days. I'm speaking my truth. I would encourage us not to speak my truth. I would encourage us to speak the truth and to live the truth. <laughs> my truth is great. That's about as valuable as your opinion. It's my truth. Okay, great. Just because it's your truth doesn't mean it's the truth. The word of God. Beware. And then the final thing, friend, be active. Be active. Recognize that we have a job to do. He talks about it right at the end. He gives us two tasks. He says, number one, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Our job is to endure. Our job is to make it. Our job is to keep on keeping on. Our job is not to back down from what is the word of God and what is the truth. Our job is to live out the Christian life in our lives every single day. We must be active and we must endure. This world is not our home. It's not. We've got to live for a different place. We've got to live in a different way. We cannot look like everybody else. We cannot go along to get along. We must stand on the word of God. Love people, care for people, teach people, lead people, but do it based on the word of God. We must endure. I love that word. Endure. Some of you are married and you're like, I'm enduring, Pastor. <laughs> Some of you are parents, I'm enduring, Pastor. You know, there's a lot of truth to that sometimes. Sometimes we need to recognize that life is not always going to be perfect. We are strangers and aliens in a foreign land. Why should we fit in? We shouldn't. We need to endure so that we might be saved. <laughs> and then be active. We need to listen. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. As a, listen, as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Wow. Wow. That seemed to be a promise. That seemed to be like an if-then statement. The gospel will be proclaimed to all nations as a testimony. And then the end will come. Just by a show of hands, let me just ask you real quickly. How many of you have had a circumstance or a situation or maybe you've watched something on the news or maybe you've seen something go on uh, in the headlines or maybe you've seen something on social media? How many of you have, have been like, oh, Jesus, would you just come back today? I'm just tired of all of this. It's just, it's all kind of, it's all going down. Everything is terrible. How many of you, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like, Jesus, just return. If you would just come back, everything would be great. You'd make all things right. I'm ready for you to come. If we are raising our hands saying we want Jesus to return, but not sharing the gospel, we're not doing our part. I want Jesus to return, then share the message of Jesus. I want Jesus to come back, then tell somebody about him. I want Jesus to come back, then share the message of the gospel. And what is the message of the gospel? I do not have it on the screen. The message of the gospel is that Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross for my sins and your sins and rose again. Some of you remember it, or some of you needed me to get you started. The message of the gospel 
is that Jesus lived a perfect life and he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again. Let's be active. Let's share that message. Let's beware of the struggles in this world. Let's make sure that we're being discerning, keeping our hearts right. Let's be aware of the things that are going on in front of us. Let's not turn blind eyes. Let's look at the things that are going on in the world. Let's, be, let's make sure that we're ready, that we're not so earthly-minded that we're no heavenly good. Let's live our lives recognizing that God has a greater plan for us. And if, we've, if we're going to say, come, Lord Jesus, then the next thing out of our mouth should be, let me tell you about him. Because that's what we're called to do. By the way, we're called to do that right here in Deland. We're called to do that in the state of Florida. We're called to do that in our United States of America. We're called to do that in Canada and Mexico. We're called to do that in all the Caribbean islands. We're called to do that in South America. We're called to do that in Africa. We're called to do that in Asia. We're called to do that in Europe. We're called to do that in Australia. Even for the people down in Antarctica, you know what they need? They need Jesus. And they need to hear the message. And God has given it to us to share it with others. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for the things that we've had the privilege of being able to hear today. And God, I pray that as we just hear your word, God, I pray that it would challenge us to live a life that is pleasing to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the love you have for us. Thank you for giving us this message to share. Let us be faithful in sharing. Let us be faithful in recognizing what you're doing. Let us be, let us be aware. Let us be ready. Let us beware of the struggles in our life. And God, make us active. Let us be the people that are willing to take the message of the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let's stand together. Let's sing this closing song about our commitment to the Lord and all that he is. Let's sing together. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleed. Side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side.